Today we're in 2 Peter, we're in chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 12 through 15. Originally I was going to look at uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 21, but I chose to stop at verse 15, and we'll pick up next time at verse 16, and you'll see why as we go through this. But it's especially because the Apostle Peter begins to speak concerning uh, the Word of God, and, all, and I want to give you a, a deeper study as we look at that portion. But today we'll look at verses 12 through 15. Let's read here in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. We'll read to verse 15, get into our study. The Apostle Peter writes, Therefore I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. This is a man who took his duties very seriously. This is a man who understood the grace of God, because as we study the life of the Apostle Peter, we note that the Apostle Peter was somebody who had, though he had a tremendous love for the Lord Jesus Christ, he was also somebody who denied he ever knew him. And so this is a man who came into contact with the grace of God. And he understood it. He understood what it meant to have a relationship with God, because he's a man who claimed to have relationship with the Lord and then denied that he ever knew him. And in that knowledge of his denial, that knowledge of denial that he carried within him was the means whereby God had brought humility to him because he was broken. And when he was broken, he found the true meaning of a word that we Christians throw around. He, he found the true meaning of the word repent. Now, repent is what has been referred to as the first word of the gospel. It's what you need to do in order to progress into a relationship with God. The word repent, as it is used in Scripture, is a word that speaks of a change of mind. And it's not simply a change of thinking, but it's a change of mind that leads to a change of life. When you really, really repent, your life is going to demonstrate that by changes that take place because you've come to understand that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness from God. And when you repent, you're actually changing the way that you think towards God and you come into a lineup with the way that God speaks concerning himself. And, and when you repent, you're actually simply coming into agreement with what God has to say. And that's something that happened in the life of the Apostle Peter. This is a man who discovered what it means to really repent. Peter had denied the Lord. And he came into great conviction because he did, did so. After Jesus was resurrected, Jesus sought out the Apostle Peter, and, and he restored him. And when we read the story of the restoration of the Apostle Peter, we discover that Jesus began to speak to him, and on three occasions in the conversation, he asked him basically the same kind of question, do you love me? And three times the Apostle Peter responded, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Yes, I do, I love you. But as Jesus was restoring him and asking that question, Upon the response that Peter gave, Jesus would say, then feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. That was what God gave Peter to do. That was the work that God gave to him, to tend and to feed, to care for. And so he became deeply serious about the service that he had to the Lord. He had a responsibility that God gave to him. He was to feed and he was to tend God's people. And, and this is something that the apostle would not fail to do. That's why when he was writing in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, that's why he wrote, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given to you a gift, a gift of the Spirit, so use it, wield it, and, and allow God's grace to work through you because God has manifested his grace to you and it's revealed in a variety of ways and so remember who gave you the gift and use it for the glory of God. And that's why he encouraged people to do that because this is a man who knew that he was to feed and to tend and he wanted people to have a relationship with God and to grow. You see, every genuine minister desires their people to grow and mature in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that 
that salvation is just the beginning, but God wants to do a work through you and in you, and he wants to continue to do that until the day he takes you home to be with him. And so every minister desires to see those who come to faith in Christ through their ministry. They desire them to grow. They, they want to see them mature. It's, it's like what, what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, verse 2, when he said, as newborn babies desire the sincere, the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, that you may grow, get into the word of God so that you might mature. It's like what Paul said to the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 19, when he, he wrote to them and said, oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Every minister wants to see the people that they minister to mature in their faith in Jesus Christ. That's why John would write in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Because the great desire of any minister is to see people progress and mature in their faith. Every minister wants to see them grow and, 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 and become men and women of God who are used by God in a mighty way. And, and this desire that the Apostle Peter had was a desire that provoked him to bring a word of reminder to them. He's saying, you've already heard these things. It's something that you already know. And though you may know these things, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't drive them into you. This is something you need to be reminded of often. And the reason that's true is because we don't always understand the first time we hear something. Much of what we know now actually develops into depth over time. You have a superficial knowledge now, or perhaps a basic grasp of it, but over time it matures, and, and that's what happens. You can read a, a Bible verse when you're first saved, and it has a certain resonance within you. There's something that happens as you read it, and you say, oh, this is great. But you come back to that same verse maybe a year later or five years or 10 years, 15 years later. And the verse actually has a deepness that you didn't really experience the first time that you read that verse. That's what happens in spiritual growth. And, and so a minister's responsibility isn't simply to just always give new information. A minister's responsibility is to re remind people, to stir their memory up, to encourage them and rekindle that within them so that their life is based on something that is fundamentally strong, it's foundationally secure. So we have to be reminded. Saturation and repetition produce a way of thinking and a way of living. And in the life of the Spirit, repetition is necessary because it's one of the ways that we learn. It's necessary because some lessons take time to more deeply receive, and the repetition of information benefits and blesses others, and that's why we continue to, to express these things, though people may have heard them in the past. When Paul was writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 1, he, he said to them, to write the same things to you, well, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it's safe. I'm reminding you of these things to keep you secure, to keep you safe, because false teachers will come in and try and build on the foundation that I have laid and try and take you into a different direction. So by giving you the same fundamental truths over and over again and reminding you more than once, it keeps you secure in your walk with God. When he was writing to Timothy to teach Timothy how to be a good minister, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he said this. He said, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto you have attained. You need to refresh their memory. You need to remind them. You need to stir them up. You need to rekindle within them. And you do that on the basis of repeating certain things so that it becomes part of who they are. That's why he says here in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, that's why he says in verse 13, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. It's right. As long as I'm alive, as long as I'm in this tent, it's, it's right for me to stir you up. When he speaks about it being right to stir you up, to stir up is to awaken from sleep. That's what it means. To awaken from sleep, to arouse the mind to render people active, to wake them up. Because a lot of times the church really is asleep, sometimes literally. When our church was young, I can still remember teaching a Sunday morning Bible study. And it was a time when our church had maybe 50 or 60 people in it. And uh, the church, that little building that we used to house the church, was uh, only able to seat 120. And it was a shallow, it was a small um, meeting place from, from 
the pulpit, I could walk to the back wall and in about 20 strides. So it's very small. And so when you have something that small, you can see everybody. You can see them, uh, you know, when you're speaking to them. As a matter of fact, that's when I began to learn to kind of just look around because if I keep looking in one direction for even more than three seconds, people think he's looking at me. He's looking at me, and it gets kind of awkward. And so that's when I started learning just to kind of look around like I do now because if I looked like we were having a conversation and I started talking about sin, <laughs> the person would get convicted and all of that and um, in a different kind of way. I do remember, though, this one lady on a Sunday morning, her son had brought her, his, his, uh, his mom to, to church. He's now a pastor of a Calvary Chapel in Virginia. But he brought mom to church. And, and as I was speaking, she, I can tell you where she was. She was on my left side right here. And, you know, when people go to sleep, their eyes cross. She was fighting it, and I could see her eyes just wandering. like. And she closed her eyes and fell on the person next to her. Just boom. You know, like the Holy Spirit was all over her. No, she fell and went to sleep. Right? And then when she hit, she woke everybody else up that was in that section. I mean, I have seen people going to sleep in home Bible studies when you've got 20 people and the one guy sitting in, Vinny used to do this, the guy's name Vinny, he's not around anymore, and he fell asleep and never woke up. But as he, as he was, he would fall asleep, and I would, I would, there he goes, you know. I have staff members who during devotions fall asleep on me, or ex-staff members now, but they, they fall asleep during devotions. I mean, I've seen it so many times. And, and in a literal sense, sometimes people will actually be so checked out of what's being said that they literally physically fall asleep. But there's also a spiritual sleep that people can have where they're not even listening to a thing that's being said. They are so asleep to the things of God. They're not listening to a word that's being said at all. And that's why he says, I'm going to stir you up. I'm going to awaken you from sleep. I want to arouse your mind. Ephesians 5.14, the Apostle Paul speaking says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. Wake up out of your spiritual sleep, he's saying. Do not become apathetic. Do not become like that, like that, that, that frog in the kettle. We well, all know that illustration of the frog in the kettle. If you take a frog and you place it in a kettle of water and uh, it's, too, it's too tall for the for the frog to jump out of, the frog will just, just sit in the kettle. It'll just sit there. If you put that kettle on, on the stove and you turn up the heat just a, a little bit, just turn up the heat just a little bit, the water's temperature begins to rise by degrees slowly. But the frog will just stay in that kettle. And then, eventually, that frog will boil to death never even noticing that the water temperature around him was becoming lethal. So you can turn the water on in a kettle with a frog in it, and he will not jump out. Don't ask me how I know that. I just do. And we are like frogs in the kettle. There are things going around us that we don't even notice. It becomes just the, what is used to be referred to as the milieu. It, it, it's the atmosphere that we live in. That we just, it just becomes normal. It becomes acceptable. It becomes the way it is. It becomes our common culture. It is just the way it is. We've all been hardened to it. All of us have been. Many years ago in ancient history, there was a prophet by the name of John Lennon, a beetle who said he is more popular, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. He had a song out where he yelled out, and this is a quote, and we all remember it, if we're old enough, or we've done some ancient discography. Christ, it ain't easy, was one of the phrases he used. And it was not played in public radio until one of the local stations said in the, in the uh, 
you know, in order to defend freedom of speech, we are going to have this song played in its entirety. And it was blasphemous. And people used to, this is hard for some of us who are younger, some of you, not us, some of you who are younger to understand, but there were words that were not used in, in public. They're called swear words. They weren't used in public. There were actually ordinances against public profanity. You could be cited and pay fines for it. And uh, there were words that you would not use in, on the radio. They used to have what they called blue, you know, blue. There were blue albums, which were profane albums, and you bought them at certain places. They were profane because they were uncensored. See, the word censored to us in our society today has become such a word that is such a bad word. But frankly, there were those who were guardians of the morals, and they said, this isn't right. These are words that are not proper. We shouldn't teach children to speak like this or to believe these kinds of things because words have power, and they ultimately will take over our culture. But there was a strong group of people that said, no, we have the right freedom of expression. So what you have today, where you turn on some of the music that some of you listen to without thinking, and the words that are being said, and the images that are being expressed, and the, the lifestyles that are being exalted, these are things that, that in the generation that my parents were part of, and that I grew in and out of, these are things that just were not proper. And so what has happened is we, like the frog in the kettle, have become very callous to things to the degree that we don't even know when something's right or wrong anymore. And the sad thing is, is I don't expect the culture to, but I do expect the church to. And that's why Paul would say, awake out of sleep. That's why Peter says, I'm going to stir your memory up. I have to awaken you to these things, is what he's saying. You have to be aroused mentally. You need to know what's going on. Be aware of what's taking place. Because you're being brainwashed by the world to believe certain things are right and other things that should be classified as wrong. Well, you don't think they're wrong anymore. We're salt. We are light. That's what Jesus said. You are the salt. You are the light. Salt of the world. The light of the world. When he said, you are the salt, you are the light, in the Greek language, there's a, a, a tense that's called the emphatic. And he was saying, you are the only salt. You are the only light. There is no other light, and there is no other salt to stop the decay and the rottenness and to, and to fight the darkness. Other than you, is what he said. That's what Jesus said about us. You are. Not David was also the pastor of this church. You are, he said. You believers. You are the salt. You are the light. And that's why the apostle Peter is saying, and you wake up. That's what he's saying. Why? Because false teachers are entering into the church, bringing false doctrine, and are going to steal the grace of God and the joy of the Lord from these people by their bad teaching. And the culture that they're living in is saturating them with things, causing them to lose sight of eternity. We need to be salt and we need to be light. And as salt and light, we need to speak up for God's righteousness. And we do so when we cast our votes. There are times when events surrounding us call us to moral action. And every few years, we have an opportunity to express our moral beliefs. And the way that we do it here in the United States is beyond the fact that we share our faith and we live our faith, but we also express our faith in one of those ways is when we vote. We vote because we're living under a system of government, according to Romans 13, that we live under that is ordained by the Lord and, and has certain kinds of responsibilities that we exercise. And we vote because... We care about others, and we see the consequences if we remain complacent. Some have been asking me, in light of the coming election, they've asked me on a personal level, how, how do you decide who to vote for? And I thought that I'd take a moment to share a few things with you, because perhaps some of you may have the same question. How do you vote? Well, this is how I vote. I, I, I look at the moral issues. Because moral issues are part of the political foundations. When I hear somebody, for example, say, oh, I believe these things because my religion teaches me that, but I only believe those personally, but I don't let those, allow those things to affect the way that I govern, then that's a person right away that I have a problem with, right away. Because if God is saturating me with his spirit and his word, then I'm supposed to live that out wherever it is that I am. 
And so somebody who's saying, well, I, I don't bring my moral beliefs in my religious beliefs. Well, for me, moral beliefs and religious beliefs are pretty much the same. How do you divide those things up? And where did you get your moral beliefs from? Well, I got my moral beliefs from my religious beliefs. Well, if you got your religious beliefs that establish your moral beliefs, then how do you vacillate? Because if you have a religious faith and a belief in a certain thing that's scripturally solid, then how do you change the way that you lead based on what the majority of people say is right? Because I believe there's a time when you have to stand up in spite of what everybody thinks may be right. When it's wrong, you stand up and you say it's wrong. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what moral courage is. That's what it's always been. And so when I hear somebody say, well, it's my religious faith, but it's not my actual practice, then I say that's hypocrisy. And so I don't hold that person in regard. So that's one of the things that I do. That's how I think. There are issues that God's word makes clear. There's no room for compromise in. So I look at those issues. One of those issues was, would be the fundamental right to life. I, I look at that very closely. How does that candidate stand on that particular issue? I did some research and got some figures, and since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision to make abortion legal, there have been over 55 million abortions. 55 million abortions. Psalm 2411 says, deliver those who are drawn toward death, hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. We have a moral voice that we should exercise, right? There are those who say, well, that's a potential life in the womb. Are you kidding me? A potential life? That's a potential human being? I've heard that argument too. A potential human being? At what point is that a human being? If you allow that child to go through full term, is the child going to be born potentially a human or is it going to be, is it potentially in the womb a dog? I mean, what is it? A potentially, it's a cat or a pen, potentially it's human. Uh, that's human life, going through various stages of, of growth. And so I believe, and the way I vote is I look at their concept of life, human life. Are they pro-life? Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Elizabeth, in hearing the greeting of Mary, when Mary came into the home, said, the child within my womb leapt at the recognition of your voice. Life begins at conception. I look at the candidate. How do you view that? I look at marriage. Marriage has been redefined by denying the biblical definition of marriage. But marriage, as the Bible has laid it out, is a fundamental building block of society. And that's why we attempt to strengthen marriages. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. I look at their definition of marriage and how they feel concerning the traditional marriage that we received instruction from God himself concerning. I look at how they treat the nation of Israel. Israel is being abandoned even now as our only ally in the Middle East. And yet, in Genesis 12, 3, God said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I want to be blessed. I will bless Israel. That doesn't mean I support everything it does. It doesn't mean that I'm 100% behind the nation in everything that it decides to do as a nation. It simply means that my heart is towards him because out of Israel came my Messiah. And I want to be blessed by the Lord. And then a fourth thing, and some people don't see this as a moral thing, by the way, but I look at our economy. I look at our economy. And, and here's something for you. Um, a lot of people don't have a concept of numbers because the numbers that we use today are so huge that it's hard to get a mind around them. It's hard to get your mind around the numbers. Again, my dad bought a brand new house in 1951, a brand new house, 
in a brand new neighborhood for $9,000. My dad was making $45 a week. His house payment was around $90 a month. So we can't get our minds around that. And today, if somebody says, I've got a million dollar house, there are a lot of people who'd say, so who doesn't? Because there are neighborhoods that are made up of million dollar homes. And so for us, the word a million doesn't mean that. The, the number million doesn't mean that much. It used to mean something in other days. So when somebody says he's a millionaire, well, think about it. Check your own heart right now. If I say, oh, that guy's got a million dollars, do you say, wow, that guy's rich? A lot of people don't. Now, it doesn't mean you wouldn't like a million dollars yourself. It simply means that's not that much. So if somebody says, oh, I wish I had a lot of money, it's not the, they're not going to say, I wish I had a million dollars, because a million dollars could be spent at the rate of $50,000 a year over, what, 20 years. So that's, that's not that much. It really isn't. So the number does not grab our attention anymore. Numbers don't do that. But let me illustrate it for you. If you had a strand of hair, and you laid it down, and then you started putting strands of hair next to it, if you were to put a million strands of hair side by side, a million would stretch the size or the length of a football field, including the end zone. That's a million. If you took a billion strands of hair and began to put them side by side, a billion will stretch 63 miles from here to Canoga Park, just human hairs. 63 miles. If you put a trillion hairs together, it will stretch 63,000 miles, which is equivalent to going around the Earth two and a half times. That's a trillion. If you put our national debt of over 16 trillion together, strands of hair, it would go around the Earth over 40 times. That's your national debt. And even as I'm speaking, it got greater. It is increasing every moment we are here. Is that a moral issue? Yes. Why? Because the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And what we are doing is we're stealing the futures from our children and our grandchildren. Within four years, the, uh, the national debt is estimated to be 20 trillion. We are establishing an amount of money owed that cannot be repaid. Is that a moral issue? Yes, it is. Because it all falls under the category of proper stewardship. Now, here's something for you. A lot of people don't understand budgets. A lot of people don't even budget. So to illustrate, we have a retreat. The retreat costs $260. It's a couple's retreat. We tell the church, we're going to have our retreat. It's going to be in August. We tell them a year in advance. The last month before August, people are saying, I wish I could go, but I don't have the money. And, and the way I approach it is like this. They'll say, well, wait a minute. If you started a year before and you didn't have one cup of coffee, we say you didn't go to your favorite coffee place, which sells $5 coffee. If you didn't have one cup of coffee one week, and you did that for a year, you'd have $260. You would have money to go to a retreat because you did something called budgeting. And a lot of people don't even know what that word means. What do you mean budgeting? It means not having a cup of coffee so I can do something a year from now. But we Americans don't really understand what that means to actually put something off because after all, I've got a dollar in my wallet and I want to spend it. If I pull it out, it speaks to me, and it says, spend me, buy something. That's what my dollar says it speaks. Money does talk. It says goodbye. It, it... <laughs> and so a lot of people don't know that. Listen, if you, if you go and you buy something and you get some change, take the change and put it in a bottle. Get a big bottle and just drop the change in a bottle. In a year, you can have between three to $500 in change. If you go and buy something, they give you a dollar in your change in return. Get an envelope. Put the dollar in an envelope. Don't spend the dollar. In a year, you can have three to $500 in just $1 bills that you didn't spend. You combine that with your change, you've got $1,000. But people don't think that way. They think, I just want to spend it. And then they say, I don't have any money. There have been people who have said to me, I don't have any money. But they do. Do you have a pair of shoes? 
Yeah, you got some money. You got some pants on, I see. You got some money. You have a house that you live in? Yeah, you've got some money. Do you have a bed that you sleep in? Yes. Do you have blankets on it? Sheets? Do you have pillows? Yeah, you've got some money. Do you have a TV set? More than one. Is it color? Absolutely. Fine. Do you have a cell phone? Two or three. You got a car? Yes, but I'm poor. No, you're not. You're dumb. You got plenty, but you don't see it. And that's the, that's the nation we live in. It's just, I got it, I got to spend it. It's like that old joke where the guy says, I know I have money in the bank, I still have checks. <laughs> We're not budgeting. And we have a nation that doesn't budget. We don't even have a budget. What home lives without a budget? What business lives without a budget? What church could make it without a budget? It doesn't happen. You can't do that. So I see this as stewardship. Is that biblical? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you're a Republican. Oh, you're a Democrat. I'm not talking Republican, Independent, Democrat. I'm talking common sense. Just basic moral sense. Make the decision based on what Scripture teaches you. That's what the Bible's supposed to do. That's what people like me who are supposed to stir you up and remind you. That's what we're supposed to do. Oh, you're meddling in my business, man. Yes. Yes. God told me to. And he meddles in mine all the time because I want to live for Jesus Christ and be blessed by God. How are you going to vote? I look at those issues very commonsensically has nothing to do with my mom was this and my dad was that and so was my grandparents and my people. It's nothing like that. Who is the best candidate? And by the way, I'm not voting for a religious leader. I don't have a president. I have a king. But what I want is somebody who can at least reflect the morals that I hold fast to and teach from this pulpit every Sunday. I do not understand how somebody can, on the one hand, say, I believe in life, but it's okay for you to put a, a rod of a baby's head, suck out the brain, it's called partial birth abortion, I cannot see how a Christian could ever say that is right. It is not right. It is wrong. And I cannot support someone who does that. I won't. I won't. It is wrong. I was just holding my granddaughter. She's two, three months old now. You know, and that's, that's a miracle of life. I could never have counseled my daughter, just put her down. You don't need her. What a trouble raising that child. We don't think that way because we value life. We value marriage. We value our relationship with the nation of Israel. We value leaving inheritance for my child and my children's children because they will never, never be able to pay off the debt if it doesn't come under control. That's how I make decisions. By the way, because God established out of Romans 13, God established human government, all the way back in Genesis 9, I feel that it's Christian responsibility and duty to vote. It's been said, and rightly so, that some... 17 million evangelical Christians didn't even vote in the last presidential election. 17 million stayed home. 17 million. And those who don't vote should go to any national cemetery that's, that's housing the, the bodies of veterans who lost their lives defending our rights. They ought to go into that cemetery and apologize if it were possible to all those people who died giving me the right to vote. They ought to apologize to them if there was a way they could do that because they died to give you and me the right to go on a Tuesday and vote. I already voted. I vote by mail. It's already done. It's a done deal because I see it as the right that God gave to me and a responsibility that I have. And when Christians stay home, it is wrong. We need to make our voices heard. And that's in a, in a practical application in a nutshell Awaken thou that sleepest, Christ will give you light. Rise up and make your voices heard. 
in the society that we live in, that is in darkness and needs the light of the gospel and needs the salt and light effect of the church. So the apostle Peter is writing concerning those things. And he says we need to be careful not to become spiritually dull. In Romans 13, 11 through 14, it says, Do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You see, he says in verse 14 uh, that shortly I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. When Jesus was ministering to the apostle Peter, Jesus said to him and was speaking to him, it's recorded in John 21, he said to him, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. And when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So he's saying, Jesus told me I was going to give up my life for him. I was going to be taken and martyred. If I took that story a little bit further, there's a certain thing there that the Lord used in my life a long time ago. That's an addition, and that is this. When the Lord said, you're going to die, the first thing the apostle Peter did is he saw John. And he says, what about him? which I find very human. Jesus is saying, you're going to die. But what about him? What has he got to do with you? Jesus said, you follow me. So next time you feel tempted to say, how come, Lord, your hand is heavy upon me, but it's not on that person over there? Just remember Jesus' words. What has he got to do with you? You follow me. That's the responsibility that you have. Follow me. And so he knew, the Lord had made it clear to him that he was going to die a martyr's death. And because he knew he was going to die, he wanted to be careful. Verse 15, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. I know that I'm going to go home to be with the Lord, but I've made sure to leave behind a witness for you. I've trained men in order that they might communicate these words to you. I've helped people to know the truth of the gospel. I've mentored men, encouraged them and trained them so that when I go home, they're going to carry on the work. Beyond that, I wrote a letter called 1 Peter. I've written this letter called 2 Peter. And by the way, it is common belief that the Apostle Peter dictated to a young man named Mark, who is one of his converts, one of his men that he mentored. And, and, uh, and that's where the gospel of Mark originates. So he said, I have left a witness. See, the most important thing for us to do is to leave a legacy. He left a written legacy, a legacy of the love of God and the work of the Spirit in a person's life. He, he left that legacy because he wanted, after he was gone, his decease, after he had stricken his tent and was with the Lord, he wanted to make sure that the people that were remaining after he had gone on to be with the Lord, that they would have a, a record, a, a witness of what God can do in a human being's life. Leave a legacy behind that is worth your children reading or knowing. I've done that. My children and my grandchildren have CDs and tapes, booklets, books, radio ministry. If I were to be taken home today, they have something for them. They could always listen to a tape if they wanted. They could watch a DVD of their grandfather or their dad, or Marie could watch should she want to put up with it, a DVD of me sh sharing. She'll always have my voice, always. My children will always have my voice. They always will. I've written little private notes <clears throat> that I have on my computer that on the time of my going home will be given to my kids so that they'll read the words of their dad. Each one has a personal message. I love you for this reason. This is what I wanted to see in your life. This is what God can do. I've done that for my children, for my wife, my grandchildren. I understand what Peter is saying. I have given you this so that at my decease, you will know the love of Christ and how to live for Jesus Christ. I have prepared for you. It's one thing to leave 
money because a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. It's wise to do that. But it's a greater thing to leave them the legacy of faith, to leave them something that matters in eternity, to leave them something that counts, faith in Jesus Christ. These letters he left were not just letters saying, hi, guys, I love you. These were letters that say, do these things, and you'll never fail. Do these things, and Christ will be with you. Do these things, your life will be blessed. And that's what he left for us as we read this 2,000 years later. But that's what you leave behind for those who will read your life when you go home to be with the Lord. Leave them a legacy that is worth reading. Leave that and live for Jesus. Awake, because it's time to be awake. We're living in difficult days. Awake, thou that sleepest, and Christ will shine on you.